We are delighted to have partnered with NordVPN again for this season. We partnered with them last year and they are, of course, a supporter of Rangers FC as an official sponsor there. And best of all, we can give you an exclusive NordVPN deal. If you go to nordvpn.com forward slash heart and hand, you will get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan and one additional month for free, completely risk free. There's a 30 day money back guarantee with Nord. And look, I use this product. I would highly recommend it. I used to work in web, so I know how easy it is to steal people's data, especially if you're using a, a, a Wi-Fi system that, that is a shared one or you're using uh, 4 or 5G, then your details can be out there. With NordVPN, they're absolutely not. And there are other advantages to it as well. Um, you can watch sporting events that maybe aren't being shown in your region. Um, you can purchase flights from different virtual locations and they do make your flights cheaper. This is very, very useful. What a price is in the UK isn't the same as what a price is in America or a price is on the continent. Um, NordVPN can save you money um, you can buy purchasing subscriptions from other countries at a cheaper price uh, and you protect your data while travelling and using public Wi-Fi I keep coming back to that anyone who's at the hassle of a cancelled card will know what I'm talking about so all you need to do is go to nordvpn.com forward slash heart and hand and you'll get a huge discount off your plan and one month additional free completely risk free I urge you to do it <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to the latest episode of Heart and Hand the Rangers podcast. My name is David Edgar and as always on the show I am your host and I'm delighted this week to be joined by two wonderful if contrasting vocally podders. First of all the splendid Mr Andy McGowan. Hello David, I don't know how you take that to be quite honest with you. And the equally wonderful Caroline Morrison. Hi David, lovely to, to join you. Well, I mean, I I would say that, that of our two podders this week, folks, one has a lovely, smooth, beautiful voice and the other sounds as rough as old badgers. But I will let you decide which one is which. And Andy, if you are in any way feeling slighted, mate, <laughs> um, just, 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 you know, that, that maybe tells you something. But let's get on. Rangers 2, Dundee United, well, Dundee United nil, Rangers 2, trip to Tanner Dice yesterday. I don't know why, but Rangers form at Tanner Dice hasn't, it's traditionally been a bit up and down, Andy, to, to say the least, over the years. Um, lots of wins there, of course, and some title triumphs, but I just I don't know if I just have it in my mind for a reason that it's one of our more difficult places to go. Equally, when I look at the results, last three trips up there, 2-1 win behind closed doors, 1-0 defeat, and a 1-1 draw. So it, it wasn't a totally irrational fear, but also has to be taken into account the Rangers away form for at least the last year, has been pretty average. So I was expecting a really tough game up there. I know that people will look at where the United are in the league. I think that a lot of that is to do with the way they started the season and they ended up sacking the manager and bringing in a new one. And he has steadied the ship. I don't think they're going to be down there. I think you could see yesterday that while they're, they're certainly not a good team by by any subjective view, they are organised and they are hardworking and they can present a tough challenge now, which maybe they couldn't have done three, four months ago. I think it's all the old cliches you're all doing, a tight pitch, tight ground, not the best surface. And uh, sometimes you get then united in a spirited uh, state of mind. And, and I, I thought they were for the first 20 minutes uh, yesterday. I thought they... They made it difficult for us and, they, and they, they closed a lot of space and that's why we were, we were getting a lot of passing across the back four and, and Lundstrom. So uh, I think what you said, their hour away form this season hasn't been exactly stellar. We've, we've still got St Mirren uh, in mind and then with the two games last season, we had Tanaday switch where kind of hellish, weren't they? I mean, the first game was a defeat and it was a probably a deserved defeat. And then the second game was just frustration upon frustration where we should have mm. we should eventually win the game. So you've got that in mind. Um but you know, Dundee United will go into the game, but they, they caused us a couple of problems in the first twenty minutes. So I think probably your assessment was, was merited. Yeah, I think first half, Caroline, I was getting the kind of game I feared, you know, what you know, as we were preparing for this game. The 
we would meet a well-organized side who were bang up for it and were working really hard, which they were. Um, partly this kind of first half to second half thing, and we'll, we'll talk about it throughout the show, part of it is that the opposition go out and they play, you know, they, they fly out the traps and they're working so hard and there is no space because they're closing it down and it's Lions in defence. They don't play like that against the other sides. We know that. It's a cup final for them and so on. But... A friend of mine did say to me at half time, they'll, they'll tire. Uh, and I said, well, they might, but we're not moving them around enough. And he said, no, we need to, to make the passing quicker. If we make the passing quicker, though, they won't be able to play at the tempo they've played in the first half, um, to which he was right. But Andy mentioned a game last year where during that stage, we lost a goal to Dundee United and could only come back to draw. Uh, it, it, I do accept that you know teams, especially in their home patch, live TV game, and it was a big live TV game. I mean, it was Sky's main TV game. Yesterday, they concentrated on Scottish football because they don't have the FA Cup. But even so, I, we have to start coming out a wee bit more. Because Andy's right, they, they've made a couple of chances for Not a lot, but one of them, the one from Smith, could easily have ended up in the back of our net. And if we go one down, then they've got something to hold on to, and it's a completely different challenge. Yeah, and, and to your earlier point, um, I watched most of the game back today just as I was working. Sky replayed it this afternoon. And it's funny because their, their current standing in the table looks pretty grim, but the last 10, 11 games, they're kind of right up there in kind of top four or five. So they have picked up a little bit of form and, and you're right to be wary of, of any away fixture in, in the kind of a ground where you've not had, you know, total success in the last few games. Um, it, it did turn out to be much comfortable, but certainly not in that first half. You're right. I, I probably would say that similar to last week, we just looked um, we looked a little like we lacked a bit of quality. Our movement wasn't great, especially in that final third. A um, bit of slackness, lack of, lack of pace, and hearing Beale talk after the game about you know that was the simple ask, just to kind of focus that little bit on quality, be a bit braver. Um, you can see the dividends that that pays I know we'll come on to talk about the detail but even that slight tweak of of Morelos coming coming on and um drawing players in making a little bit of space and players like Sakala being a bit bolder made all the difference and I would just love it for their collective uh well-being if they could maybe start games like that because it it doesn't make for fun viewing (laughs) the first half of these games recently no, uh, the first half against Kilmarnock, if it follows recent trends, Dell Ball versus us passing the ball sideways could be one that makes your eyes bleed, but um, we'll come to that in a couple of weeks. Andy, on the striker thing, we're in a position now, I think, where the Alfredo Morelos debate, certainly online, is entrenched. And you have people who just want rid of him, can't see any good that he brings anymore. You know, we all know that the sort of lines that they come away with, um, you're overweight, can't run, all that kind of thing. Then you've got the people who just cannot accept any criticism of him at all, and they will always find, well, he hasn't had much game time, and, you know, the, the previous manager didn't use him properly, and all of these kind of, he's been playing through an injury. Whereas, I think you can be a wee bit more objective if you just stand back, and it People said to, to me, the, the, the latter camp said, oh, he changed the game. Well, he, he didn't, right? He helped, though, Rangers to change the game because when he came on, he's a different type of striker to Antonio Cholak, who very much did look like a guy who was just back for his first game in a few weeks uh, and unfortunately did pick up another injury. But what Morelos' game, what his style does is that he draws players towards him. He occupies the centre backs, and that creates more space for the two number tens and then the mm. full backs. And that's what we didn't have in the first half, and that's what we did in the second. Now, you can still point out there's been a couple of times where he's put through in goal and he just doesn't have the legs to get through in the way that, that classic Alfie, if you like, does, where he would just drive on and get the shot away. And a couple of times yesterday, he didn't do that. It, it's almost like for some people, Alfie can't have, have done okay. He has to have either been rubbish on the one hand, or brilliant on the other. I thought yesterday he played his part. He did well, um, a good substitution. I don't think he was, you know, the reason we won the game, but he definitely contributed towards it. Um, Am I being a wee bit too fuddy-duddy sitting in the middle, or is there a case for saying that maybe people need to kind of just take off the the pre-decided notions about Alfie being either brilliant or rubbish? (laughs) I think that we as a support need to apply 
that kind of tempered viewpoint on everything, not just Morelos, but that's a different story. Because um, I'm pretty clear where I'm in, with Morelos at this point in time, which is that if you want a, a chance in the six yard, well, in the 18 yard box anywhere, really, I want Cholak on the end there. But who do I want leading the line? Who fits better? It's Morelos for me. And it's just a pity we've got to this stage now where you've got the added complication of his contract situation. But I, I do think that there is a tune to be had out of Morelos because at the point of his career, he needs to get a move or he needs to get a new contract. I think there's more likely to be a move at this point in time. So he needs to show something or else he'll end up at um, a club that maybe wouldn't pick. So uh, you're right, he didn't change the game yesterday because I don't think he turned, touched the ball by the time he scored the first goal and he'd barely touched the, goal, the ball by the time he scored the second goal. So he didn't change the game. But I do think that your point around the number 10s and how Beal's play, Beal plays is 100% correct that we need a, a, a central striker that can hold the ball and have defenders bouncing off him and win free kicks and stuff like that. And Morelos does that a lot, lot better than Cholak. And I'm going to blow your podcast up, David, because I love Cholak. I think he's great. But if he's your first choice striker next season, I think we've got a problem because I don't think he's good enough. I think he's too one dimensional. And I think he'll have a massive role to play over a season, but I don't think he would be my first choice striker. I would love to see Morelis and Cholak in the same team. I watch Brentford and I see how they play with two up front, but they play three at the back. And I wonder if we could do something like that. No, no, every week, but some weeks, you know, um, Tillman playing more centrally suggests to me that Morelis could, to a degree, take that kind of position as well. Not, not exactly the same, because he'll not get the same running with the ball. But I would like to see Cholak and Morelis at, at points in games together. So that's, that's where I'm at. But is that enough in the fence for you? No, I think Chola, I, I know exactly what you're saying with Chola. I don't necessarily think he's a Michael Beale striker because of what we've just said. Beale likes a number nine focal point and then behind that he likes two number tens. Mm-hmm. Um, yesterday, Kent and Tillman, and has been Kent and Tillman since he came back. Uh, and you need a guy that, if you like, can bulldoze a wee bit and clear a path and clear some space and occupy the defenders and not let them come out and occupy that space as Dundee United did in the first half. Um, and I'm not quite sure Cholak fits into it. Equally, what you also said about he's the most reliable finisher that we have. And I I, I go back, Caroline, to Chris Boyd, and we always would say, you know, that was it. you don't play him in the big games, or Walter didn't play him in the big games. You know, he didn't really start against Celtic. He didn't really start um, in Europe. But equally, when we've gone back and done shows that look at seasons, Chris Boyd has played a pivotal role in us winning titles because the amount of games where it's, you know, that we're forgotten about because, you know, Rangers 2, St. Johnson 0 at Ibrox in November, um, dull game, Boyd 2, you know, Hibs 0, Rangers 1, Boyd. Cholak can do that for me. He's a guy who would contribute in that sense. But for certain matches, you need that presence. Uh, and, and for example, I think Ruth's a good striker, but I don't think he does it either. You need Alfie or AN other who can provide that for you. Exactly. And I think we've got that conundrum with our, our strike force at the moment. Alfie is not at peak fitness, and we all know that. Like you quite rightly said, that ability to take the ball, run at a player, you know, find a shot. He's not got the, the fitness levels to do that at the moment, and it's a shame. However, he does bring a lot to the side, you know, without that element to his game still. And probably to echo what Andy said. If you were to to push me on it, I'd probably rather Morelos, even in this slightly less fit state, than than Cholak, just from a kind of consistency point of view. Um, but you're absolutely right. Cholak can offer so much and has offered so much already yeah. this season. It's been unfortunate for him. He has had those um, those injury issues. I did think though, I was disappointed with him yesterday. I thought his movement was a bit poor. And that kind of link up with some of the other, with a couple of uh, number 10s and the other forward players, I just thought was really lacking. But it was it was a kind of lacklustre performance among a sea of them uh, in that first half. So I don't want to just call out Cholak, but um, it's going to be difficult for him. You know, he's he struggled with consistency in form before the injury. Um, he's now, you know, seemed to pick up another injury. It's going to be quite difficult for him to work his way back in, especially with Roof coming back and you know, fingers crossed if he can keep his his um his kind of playing injury free, then you've got to think that he'll be um in contention a, a little more. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, Ruth's movement is is the thing. You find a spot for him in that three, I think, because of, of what he can provide. And he's a good finisher as well, and he'll get you goals. But yeah, the first half, there wasn't really a lot to, to write home about. There was, of course, the inevitable VAR controversy. Um, it wasn't a penalty. It wasn't a penalty. That's why it wasn't given. And Andy, I, I actually think that the officials who look not going to be a hypocrite, we lambast on here, don't think the, the standard of Scottish officiating is, is particularly good, and we say it, but I think it took a bit of strength after the attempts in the week by Celtic to to basically whip up a VAR storm and make it difficult for referees to give a decision against them or for us, and I think that the referees were, they deserve a bit of praise for going, you know, it wasn't a penalty, I hit him on the arm, his arm's down by his side, it's not a penalty. No, I'm at the game and there was nothing. There was no. There was a wee rumble for the their their supporters, but you know the players weren't exactly uh, vociferous in their appeal. So that usually tells a story and how um, fleeting or how kind of negligent the, the, the negligible the, the decision could be. I I think that <laughs> I'm going to say something here, David, and you can soundbite it. I think the standard referee this year has been reasonable. There you go. Wow. And I said a couple of weeks ago about Colin, I said by his standards he had a good game. I can't remember what game it was. I've never been in that position in my life before. I've always thought the referee was just deplorable. But VAR is, VAR is helping. And the one thing I would say about referees in Scotland is that they've needed help for longer and weary, not just through a, a VAR type system, but also in terms of leadership of here's the standards of tackle that's permissible because you know we watch Scottish football and we watch English Premiership and there's been quite a golf over many years of what's been acceptable and what's known in both leagues. Um, so things, dare I say, have been a wee bit better. You know, there's been, we've had their moments, but overall I think VAR's helped greatly because I think it's taken the pressure off these guys. What Celtic are doing in this campaign, it's deplorable. It's absolutely deplorable and they're undermining the whole of Scottish football, no for the first time. I mean, we can go back to when we had to get foreign referees, for Christ's sake, and mm-hmm. even at that, it didn't change anything because they were still getting decisions against them that they would, they would have moaned about. So they're going down a very, very nihilistic path, Celtic, and it's born out of an institutional mindset, which is now, you know, it's irreversible as far as I can see. It's draining. It's draining. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that Celtic, um, they, they always come away with, ha-ha, you know, Rangers got a decision in Scotland, then they go into Europe, and it's different. Well, we reached the European final last year, so, you know, uh, just saying. Uh, that doesn't seem to, to stack up. Caroline, let's move on then to Fashion Sakala. Um, look, everybody loves fashion. It's a great wee guy. He's, you know, so infectious personality, so, you know, happy and you just want him to succeed and he's been good under Michael Beale. first half yesterday I was screaming uh just you know what are you doing there were a couple of times that he ran up and it was he was almost surprised there was somebody standing in front of him trying to take the ball off him there was one incident where he gets to the byline and he looks up Tillman and Cholak are there for a, a, a to pass it back but he somehow tackles himself um, and unfortunately for us, he wins the tackle and <laughs> knocks it out for a throw. And you're thinking, well, this is fashion. You know, sometimes he does good things, sometimes he does bad things. But the thing about him is that he does it in the same game. And then in the second half, he starts off a move and gets on the end and then produces an absolute world of a two touch finish one to set it, two to put it away with different feet. Uh, Michael Beale spoke about it after the game. And he spoke about, you know, I know he can be frustrating for the fans, he's frustrating for us and the management team, but he does deliver numbers, he does score goals, he, he has influence in it. And I think he's probably in his richest vein of form in his, his time at Rangers, if you look at over the last six games or so. Yeah, I, I absolutely adore Sakala. I don't think anyone doesn't. He's just so likeable, such an infectious personality and it's just pure endeavour. Even if it doesn't quite come off for him, He's just got that willingness um, and that drive. We, we absolutely saw the best and worst of him yesterday. I was uh, again at the stadium uh, yesterday and that first half was, was really close to where um, 
I was standing and him kind of tripping over the ball or just trying to do a little much and not getting past that that final man kind of summed up um a frustrating first half for poor Sakala and it's frustrating for us to watch as well because we know that he can offer so much more he was you know man of the match practically against Celtic and then you, you get into the second half he has a wee pep talk clearly from Beal and he's kind of refocused if you like about what he needs to do and and to kind of almost clear away any baggage just think about how he's going to contribute to the game and what what's being asked of him and you see him almost relax a little bit and like you say for him to be involved in the build-up to that goal continue that run lose his man be able to take a little touch on his right foot and then hit the ball just absolutely sublimely to score that goal it's just in anyone's standards that's a fantastic bit of play and a fantastic goal and if you can tap into that form with Sakala and kind of um, cultivate it a bit more we'll be extremely lucky it's just a matter of consistency with him uh, and and making sure that we get the, the best out of him and I'm glad to see it I'd really like to think that him touching on the fact that Beal coming back in and being part of the squad if you like that that signed him and him really responding to Beal coming back and kind of um, reinvigorating his his play I'm hoping that we'll see much more of this Andy on a point Caroline makes there because of the type of personality that fashion is and as we say you know he's he always gives you 100% percent might not the level of quality but you you know you can never fault the work right he does play you know with that kind of smiley face we see the interviews I think sometimes you almost think confidence is not an issue there that it comes from within and you know like all great you know all players and I mean great players but all players that yes it does have to come from within but he's a human being and when you're not getting picked or you're getting 20 minutes here and there and, and you know you're not featuring it grates on you and I think Sometimes that we maybe look at someone like Ken and you'll hear a lot, oh, he doesn't have much confidence when he's not playing well. It's not something you hear a lot about Sakala. And I think, again, it is the personality thing. But clearly having a manager who does think, look, you're important here. I'm going to play you. I think, for example, him getting the nod in the old firm game, when I think we all thought going, in fact, I know that certainly three of us thought he would go with the extra midfielder. And instead, Bill went, no, I mean, it was great, you know, because it was like, no, I want to attack, we're at home. And secondly, it must have been great for Sakala. I just think sometimes we can be a little bit, if you like, almost fooled by the type of personality. Whereas you look at others and you think, well, you know, no, no, you know, they've in their shell a wee bit. But he's reveling, I think, in having a manager that's gone, go on, I know what you can do, go and do it. I I mean, I, I've, I've always liked Sakala. I'm not just saying that because he's in a bit of form, but I'm, I'm feeling pretty... Um, satisfied because I mean uh, they should have a, a Sakala case study on the big screens before the next home match because here's a guy that he's no, he, you can see he's not came through an academy we know that his background is totally different from most of our players if not every single player we've got and as far as I know his wife's no here don't think that's bothering him much but that's another story and he's uh, he, I've said before time and again he plays with an empty head and sometimes we've needed that, especially a season when it's just been doom and gloom. And uh, uh, you could see visibly some of our players walking under the pressure of playing for Rangers at a, a test in time. He never hides. And he, he's better than he gets tr- uh, credit for, right? Because obviously he's not got the quality, he's not got that. That goal yesterday was stupendous. And it was really, really satisfying to watch because it's one of the goals you've scored that you're sailed in the park or five sides or in FIFA. You'd be like, oh, what a great goal. It just it's like probably the rover stuff, you know, the flick up and score. And I think he's an asset to the whole team because and the whole squad because of that attitude we're speaking about. He will, as you say, David, have been feeling doubt and pressure because Gio, I mean, I think Gio was trying to sell him. Is that another case at the start of the season? I think he would have taken an offer for Sicala. Yeah, if, if, if an offer had come in, I think, yeah. He would have got to get a sniff, I, I, I don't think we would have been difficult to deal with, I believe mm-hmm. is the is the phrase. And the, to get to the kind of case study I'm talking about, you know, sometimes players need time to settle and play for Rangers. It's a hard team to play for, a hard club to play at, and it's even harder when things don't go to plan straight away. And for better players in Sakala, that it's taken them a wee bit of time to get up to speed. Now, that doesn't mean that every player get, follows that arc, you know. I'm not sitting here saying that Matondo is now going to turn it around, but we've had players that have done it, right? 
And Sakala now is getting himself in a position where, just like we're talking about Cholak, can contribute. We as a support need to understand that a player doesn't need to be a starter every single week to be a Rangers player. We've got a squad, and as we know, the, the fact has changed now, that the, the squad plays the biggest part. That's why Celtic are leaders. They've got a better squad rather than a better first 11, it's arguable. So he has 100% got a role to play at Rangers, um, and, it, and I think he'll revel in that. Coming in and out of the team, may, maybe not being a specialist player, but I can see games where when it's tight like that, he can be the difference. I thought that, that first goal, not just the finish, but you know the the drive forward, he gets bumped by the, the, the underrated defender by a fair whack, and he just keeps going and drives through at some pace, and it just cuts through them. Uh, to, to make the breakthrough. So I love him. I, I really love him. And I think he's, I, I've always thought he's got a role to play. I'm not his agent, but I wish I was. Mm. Well, um, I think that t- to me, it's been said before, it's not any great insight for me, but there are definitely a lot of similarities to Nacho Novo. And that, you know, not always a starter. And we're aware of the kind of limits on the ability. But equally, you look at the end of the season and you go, well, wow. He did pretty well. And I think he did that even last season when, when mm-hmm. people looked at the amount of goals he got and went, oh, I, I didn't realise that. And I think he does have that um, ability to, but, to contribute. But see, the thing is, Davey, which two his best games have been against Celtic. Oh, Park absolutely. Kidd, but Park Nacho. Kidd, Park, Park Kidd last year, he scored that goal and he should have scored another one he hit the post. And, and that would have made the, the final couple of games really, really interesting. And then he had a great game last week, well, great second half last week as well. And that's sometimes can be the difference about how a player arrives at Rangers and how they lead. Well, I mean, as I said, Nacho was exactly the same with yeah. that. Um, he was he was somebody that was very much in that uh, in that particular boat. Like you know, some of his games were huge, huge games. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Sakala definitely has that ability. Another player, slightly different because he doesn't look ungainly or awkward, I think, a lot of the time. But sometimes he's not influenced the game the way that you want him to and the way you think you can. And in fact the manager spoke about this yesterday where he said he was one that he was challenging at half time to do better and that is Malik Tillman. And again, with that second goal, it's a tremendous finish, Caroline, because there are a lot of bodies on the line, Rangers and Dundee United players. There are not a lot of space uh, a lot of spaces to put the ball into and certainly not a lot of time to decide what to do with it. And in terms of the ball falling to anyone in our team at that point, he is the guy I would pick because he does have the composure to do it. And I think in his case, you know, the, the manager refers a lot to he's young. People keep forgetting that he's young, but he's undoubtedly got talent. He does. He's someone that I think is is genuinely exciting. And I know that he's got you know, a fairly significant price tag, you know, if, if we do choose to, to buy him. But with the age he is, the potential he's got, what we've seen so far in terms of his contribution, it almost feels like if you were to sign him, it's a player you couldn't possibly lose money on. Um, knock on wood, of course. But he did do well yesterday. It was a, a wee bit of good luck because Jack was able to intercept what was a, was a really poor pass. Um, Sakala's shot was saved. And we were, were fortunate, like you say, that the, the clearance did fall to Tillman because he does have that composure um, and he had just enough time to to slot it in very neatly into the corner. Um, I sometimes think that he, he looks like he's a little bit overwhelmed by sometimes the pace of the Scottish game. But I, I will admit that I've seen big improvements with him you know, even over the, the short period he's been here. I think he's becoming more accustomed to what's required of him and he's certainly someone that I think, I hope, will have a future if we can find the budget to, to sign him permanently. We, we've been probably a wee bit too quick in the past to, to make calls on these things. And thankfully, we don't have to, to do so yet. But I think all signs are, are pointing in the direction of that's someone you'd want to make your own when yeah, I, I it comes so. to the end of the season. Yeah. I, th- I think the manager wants to. You know, yeah. I think he's been, he's been quite... Um, firm about that um, in his interviews since he's come in that he's he's a boy he rates and and I think again it's the whole we tend to look at a player and think that well that's him you know um, that's what he's going to contribute for good and for bad and we need to remember sometimes players get better which is what you want and then sometimes with age in particular they deteriorate so uh, where we are with a player 
now isn't necessarily where we're going to be with a player in a year. And I think that in Tillman's case, there's no reason to think that as he develops, gains experience, he won't become a better player. He won't add more to his game. Because as you say, all the all the skills are there. For me, it's just about him learning how to knit them together consistently. Um, but And again, I, I'd, I'd still include him in the column of he is still contributing this season. He is playing his part. He's getting goals, important goals, and he's creating. So, yeah, he would, he would, I would be keeping him, I've got to say, um, when the opportunity comes up in the summer. Moving on then to, to something else, Andy, that has been a noticeable improvement, and that is us defensively. And there's a couple of things I want to talk about. Firstly, it's not coincidence. It's fairly straightforward and obvious that if you have a settled central defence with your two first choices there, it's going to be better than when you're chopping and changing and it's guys five and six and sometimes even below six that are having to play in there. But Davis and Goldson had looked like a good partnership before Goldson got injured. And I mentioned this on our daily update show on Patreon that I, I see echoes of Moore and Amoruso with the two of them and that you have one who's the kind of defensive leader, the talker, who goes and attacks the ball, that's Goldson, and then you've got the guy who sweeps in behind, who tidies up, and that's Davis, and they work well. And I think that when we saw Davis with other centre halves, it didn't work as well because he's not a leader, and with those other guys, he kind of had to be. Goldson, for example, I think, if it Goldson and King would have done better than King and Davis, for Mm -hmm. example, because I think that's just Goldson's personality and type of player that he is. But again, yesterday, I thought they were very calm, very controlled, dealt with what they had to deal with. Um, And again, because they're both comfortable in the ball in the second half, Rangers utterly dominated possession. And that was because we were able to push Lundstrom and Jack 10 yards further forward, which in turn meant we were winning the ball in better areas. Caroline mentioned there the goal. And the United couldn't get out. Uh, It's been a real positive there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Goldson is the key, as you see, because I think most times, as long as you've got Goldson and another, then your your team is usually safe enough. But I like Davis. He's, um, I mean, we've had our issues in terms of injury, right? I don't think it was fair to make judgments on him because he was coming back in and been back out and playing half a game and all this kind of stuff. This is a match like getting a bit of time uh, in succession, now playing for Rangers and decent games and decent results. Um, I like his use of the ball. He reads the game well. He's, as you say, he's not quite as commanding in there as as uh, Goldson or even your typical centre half. We seen that early doors yesterday with Fletcher causing him a couple of problems, but he deals with it a different way. So I'm not that. It's not as if I'm sitting here worried about him losing balls in the air because he deals with it a different way in terms of how he, he backs into a player or uh, sorry, doesn't back into a player. He gets allows a player to back into him, but doesn't let him pass. So the defence of Situation has improved since Beal came in because I think the overall defensive situation from the front to the back has improved because we're not back to the classic Gerard Beal press that we saw in the 55 season. We're nowhere near that. But I do think that the front three or front four, what you want to call it, are now far more comfortable in moving around the park and not as rigid and therefore they know their role. And talking about Tillman, um, even Sakala to a degree, there's Winning the ball back and the recoveries are getting better and better. Kent has always been really, really diligent defensively, and I think it's something that gets massively overlooked with him. His tactical diligence is fantastic for the type of player he is. Sakala, I'm not saying he's a defensive player, or he's defensively minded or defensively sound. What you saw against Celtic, recovery tackles, chasing back, and I think our, our entire team now is just a wee bit more robust in terms of stone teams getting close to your goal and that will have certainly held the back four um, so it'd be interesting to see what happens because obviously we've got Suter coming back and I, and I think we've got a no right off our expectations with Suter but you know if he comes back in I think he's going to be another one of the players like we're talking about Cholak will come in and do a job uh, for certain games but he's probably not going to be in the first 11 the, you know your first choice 11 it's interesting to see links with Cooper, Jake Cooper at Millwall. I don't know if there's anything in it because he's a big, a really big commanding centre half. And for you, Davy, you, you you illustrated the difference between a Goldson and a Davis. He'll be more of a, a Goldson, albeit left sided, I think. So um, I'm far more comfortable with the way we defend set pieces and attack them, incidentally, because I think the organisation has improved. I think everybody in the team knows their role 
Um, and I think it's, them, it's it's proof positive in the, in the clean sheets we've had. Caroline, the other defensive change yesterday was uh, the return of John McLaughlin into the side. Now, he had played uh, at Ross County, for example, and he played again yesterday. The manager was asked about it. Um, for Ross County, he said Alan McGregor had picked up a slight injury, so that's why he didn't play. Yesterday, Alan McGregor was on the bench, though, and he said, well, I just felt it was time for John to come back in. I've got three good keepers, and today is a game that suits John. And I found that quite interesting because there's a few factors involved. Firstly, we obviously have the Cup semi-final next week, and then we've got the the match against um, St. Johnson in the Cup the week after that. Uh, so I think John McLaughlin might have played those anyway because he's been the Cup goalkeeper, so I think that, that there was a, a chance he would play that. But when Bill and Gerrard were here just before they left, in fact, at the start of 21-22, they rotated the goalkeepers a fair bit, and something Gerrard said was, you know, we can't ask Alan to play every week now because of his age. And I wonder if there is a, just a kind of gradual phase-out. I caveat all of that with, we are going to need to buy a new goalkeeper. And we're not going to do it in January, the manager said, but certainly in the summer. We need to be looking at who's going to be the Rangers' number one for the next two, three, four, five years. So this is a short-term discussion, I think, between now and the end of the season. But I, I think that Kilmarnock game will be fascinating to see who plays in goal there. And if it's McLaughlin, I think you're looking at maybe McLaughlin playing the next four in a row. And if that's the case, then quietly he's become the new number one. Yeah, that that would make a lot of sense actually. And and to your earlier point, I would agree that it's it's you know we've we've all said that that's absolutely a, a priority position that we need to fill with a long term view. Um, McGregor, as a fantastic servant as he was, he's getting to that age where you know there's there's just no way we can offer any extension or any additional uh, length of contract. Um, it's the right time for him to go. That of course is a question mark over whether or not McLaughlin is able to to kind of fit into that regular number one slot I have reservations myself but you're right I think introducing him a bit more in a controlled slow fashion like this and seeing where that takes us between now and the end of the season at least gives you a really good benchmark um, that you can compare at potential other available goalkeepers to and, and see um, what what might be then a kind of challenge come the start of next season over who gets that kind of regular number one starting point. And I like the fact that we're flexible as well in, in how we deploy our goalkeepers. You know, Beale talked about the fact that, you know, set pieces uh, may be kind of very important in yesterday's game. It turns out they weren't. But, you know, although McLaughlin had very little to do, I agree that if that were to be the type of game, then of course he you know, his ability to come out a little better than McGregor is probably the right option. Um, so I like the fact that we've got a, a bit more flexibility there and an openness to being flexible and trying different things, um, you know, horses for courses. But like yourself, I, I just, I, I worry that if we have too much of a reliance uh, on McLaughlin long term, um, that doesn't feel like a good fit for me. No, I mean, he, he got the opportunity to be the number one and unfortunately didn't take it and that is going to count against you. Again, you know, there's a manager here who believes in him, but, you know, Van Broncos clearly did or he wouldn't have been the number one. Uh, I think statistically it's been pointed out a lot recently that, that um, 11 of the last 18 shots McGregor's face has gone in. Now, statistics don't tell you everything, but I think even the eye test is telling you that you know, the, not the guy he was, understandably so. I mean, he was as good as it gets. But he's not... We always used to say with McGregor that there were a couple of flaws in his game, but they were more than made up for by the shot stopping. And Andy, I'm not sure we can say that anymore. Nah, I'm, I'm kind of in denial about this. <laughs> uh, it's hard to admit, isn't uh, it? It's, it's, it's not nice. Uh, I, I mean, I think I've said when, when I pointed up to that McGregor's still the best goalie, and if I was pushed, I'd probably still say that. I think uh, McLaughlin's problem this season is that the support have looked at the Ajax and the Celtic away game and you know, more or less unloaded on him. Um, and I go back to the other point I was made about how we've defended as a team under Van Bronckhorst and how we look, I suspect, we're, we're defending front to back under Beal. And I think it was quite unfair. I mean, we had, had one real howler at Parkhead. Um, I thought Ajax, the whole team, got outplayed and they were on our doorstep or six-year box before. We knew it far too often, and what chance does a goalkeeper go in that kind of situation? So, um, 
our big problem this summer is signing a goalkeeper because just as we're talking about supporter attitudes towards uh, Sakala, Tillman, and uh, giving players time, understanding the role, Rangers goalkeepers a big space to fill, and uh, I doubt that. I, I, I think you might, or I suspect you might see as they something similar to what Celtic have done, which is uh, with Joe Hart, which is by a, a really experienced goalkeeper that's maybe you know fell off the radar or something like that. Um, I think it's a big problem because I, I don't know if John McLaughlin is a full time number one for us. I like him again. He, he, he fulfilled a role yesterday, Tanny, because I'm talking about Tate Park and us moving the ball about. And he really, really helps with that because it, you can see that the defenders in front of him are very, very comfortable firing a ball back to him. In fact, they had a Cruyff turn in the first half, which is absolutely magnificent. If you watch back, the ball came to him and he, he did this one move Cruyff turn with the ball. But I think we've got a big problem filling, filling that position next year because it's going to be critical. I think that with John McLaughlin, I always get the impression that he looks absolutely fine when you don't know if he's the number one and I, I don't know whether it's because we judge him differently and go well he's not the number one he's doing really well mm-hmm. and then when he is the number one you go hmm, my expectation level is now up here uh, so I think when there's a bit of dubiety uh, he's been brought in for the odd game whatever nobody bats an eyelid but then when he was a number one and the focus got more intense but I still can't be shifted from the fact that I think we need a new goalkeeper um, no, as you say to, to look to the next few years as well but Something you touched on there, Andy, is it, it's a personality job. Kind of like, you know, Manchester United we've found over the years in that sense as well. To be a Rangers goalkeeper, it, it's not enough to be a technically very good goalkeeper. You need that something else. Aye, and, M- and McGregor's a big pair of gloves to fill. Yeah, very uh, much for, so. Because it's not, not just on the park, but in the dressing room, and you see, you still see his influence on the park. Um, and it takes a very, very special goalkeeper actually to, to come into Rangers straight away and, and you know cement that because all eyes are on you and we've been spoiled over the years really when you think Very about much it. So. I so, mean our, our run from 1986 right has been you know um, Woods, Gorham, Kloss <coughs> and Gregor. I'll yeah. put those four up against anybody's run in that time. Anybody's in the world football I'll put those four up against. Mm-hmm. Totally agree. So, yeah, so uh, I think that says it's it a massive job. And because of that legacy, our expectations of what that person needs to be able to do are sky high and it ain't going to change. Um, it's kind of like, I, I think, Rangers centre half as well mm-hmm. is another position that we judge very highly on because of what we've seen in the past. But that's life in the big city. If you want to come and, and play for Rangers, that's what you need to be able to do. Now, we are linked with a number of players. I'm sure you've seen Todd Cantwell. Uh, Tom Davis is another one that's been mentioned. Jerry Yates is another one that's been mentioned. Jake Cooper, is, as Andy said. We won't go into that too much here um, because we know that you listen to a show at different uh, times of the week and it could have been superseded. But, of course, you'll get the up-to-the-minute information over on our Patreon site, patreon.com forward slash heart and hand. If you subscribe from just one ninety nine per month, then you will never miss a thing. You'll get daily discussions and stuff like that and a lot more deep dives for the stuff that we can only really touch on the surface of the flagship show. Right then, folks, that will do me for today on the flagship show. I would just like to take a moment to thank our executive producers in London, Mike Lee and Paul Myers, and to thank my two wonderful guests for a very enjoyable chat. First of all, Caroline Morrison. Yeah, thank you, David. That was a pleasure. And Andy McGowan. Thanks, Davey. I've, I've worked out who's got the smooth voice and who's got the rough voice now. Yeah, go easy on her, mate. Go easy. On her. <laughs> she's, she's trying. She's trying her best. Um, Adam will be back if you are one of our uh, free show listeners. Adam will be back with Heart and Hand Extra later this week. But like I say, you know, it's New Year. You're bored. You've got to go into work. It's pissing down the rain. Sign up to Heart and Hand. Meet a whole new bunch of people that you will thoroughly enjoy hanging out with. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next Monday to report on the match against Aberdeen. Until then, have a good one. <laughs>